BBC One returns now to Normandy to join in again with this morning's commemorative events on this 50th anniversary of the day when 156,000 troops landed on the beaches of Normandy. On the eve of this great adventure, I send my best wishes to every soldier in the Allied team. To us is given the honour of striking a blow for freedom which will live in history. And in the better days that lie ahead, men will speak with pride of our doings. Beaches of Normandy, June the 6th, 1994. And it's impossible to believe that these are the same beaches as those that witnessed the events of D-Day exactly 50 years ago. What we can say is that on that day from 0630 onwards on the westernmost beach, codenamed Utah, these sands shook with the sounds of battle and the noise of thousands of ships, vehicles and guns. The Allied military commander, General Montgomery, saw the battle in these terms. Every obstacle must be overcome, every inconvenience suffered, every risk taken to ensure that our blow is decisive. We cannot afford to fail. Montgomery had no doubts about the likely success of the landing, but that confidence had to be realized in brutal reality on the beaches themselves. Because opposing him were the divisions of the German Field Marshal Rommel. His belief was that the Allied attack had to be stopped on the actual beaches. Rommel it was who warned that the matter would be put to the test on what would prove to be the longest day. Fifty years on, today's events along the Normandy coast from Caen to sainte mere Eglise mark not only a commemoration of the successful landings themselves, they honour those who died on the day and those who lost their lives in the whole Normandy campaign. The Normandy was after all the prelude to the liberation of the whole of Europe from Nazi rule. The sacrifices honoured today opened the door to freedom for millions more. It was a little earlier today that the first celebration took place. President Clinton talking to veterans of one of the main American events, a very particular event, that was at Grand du Oc. This was situated critically between the two main American assault beaches and the elite unit of rangers uh, whose veterans you see here had as their objective the destruction of German batteries on top of those cliffs. And many of the comrades of these veterans fell in the course of taking that. There was a heavy toll exacted by these men uh, and uh, their colleagues 50 years ago. More than half of them became casualties. So these really are a precious band of survivors to whom the president is paying, the, is paying tribute. For their part, the Canadians will shortly be holding their own commemoration at their war cemetery at Courseul. But really the emotional centre of this morning's events, the centre is the five war cemeteries sited near the coast from Ronville to the principal one at Bayeux. Each will have its own service attended by a member of the royal family and at Bayeux the Queen and President Mitterrand will attend the principal service of remembrance. So the dead will be honoured. And then in the afternoon, Omaha Beach, the main U.S. landing area, that will be the site of the big international event attended by all the heads of state of the wartime allies. While here back at Aramanche, uh, we're preparing for the British event under the shadow, as you can see, of the most potent existing symbol of D-Day, the decaying caissons of the Mulberry Harbour. We're now round into the harbour with a landing craft there, and the town is very heavily cordoned off, a lot of security, but at around four o'clock, uh, UK time, the Queen will round off the day with a review of over 7,000 British Normandy veterans. So it's a day when proper thanks for sacrifice and real gratitude for victory 
walk decently and rightly hand in hand. Now, the first event of the day took place a good deal earlier. At uh, 0625, that was HR in 1944, the landings actually began. This morning, at precisely the same time, the flags of the participating allies, which had been ceremonially embarked in Portsmouth yesterday, arrived in Normandy, quietly trooping ashore here at Aramorsch in circumstances very different from those 50 years ago. There there are seven of the flags in each landing craft. This time they were met by the world's press. It was very different 50 years ago. The British and the uh, American flags coming off first, just a short jump into the water. Imagine what it was like when you were jumping into three feet or four feet. The French flag coming off next, uh, a mild splash. It was very different. And those are the Canadian and the Polish flags marching ashore there. Uh, the flags are then handed over from the Channel Party to the Shore Party, that's the British flag being handed over uh, next, of course, the American flag. The Channel Party stepping back and turning and marching away, their job completed. And uh, then the Shore Party, in turn, about to march away. There was actually a, a crowd. Uh, it's not just the cameramen there, the British flag, the British flag carrier marching off the beach at uh, Aramorsch and uh, all that witnessed by a crowd of people who got up pretty early to see this symbolic commemoration of the actual landings 50 years ago. Rather a lot of people on those stands behind. So. Let's remind ourselves what the Allies needed to achieve on the longest day itself. Mike Dewar is with me here again to set these events into their perspective. What really were the essential objectives, Mike? They had to achieve so much on that first day, John. They had to ensure the success of the greatest military undertaking, combined operation, really, in the history of warfare. The objectives for Montgomery's 21st Army Group on D-Day were very ambitious and included the capture of Bayeux and Caen by midnight on D-Day. In the event, these hopes proved extremely optimistic. The US First Army under Bradley would land in the west on Utah and Omaha beaches, whilst the British Second Army under Dempsey would land in the east on Gold, Juneau, and Sword beaches. These seaborne landings would be preceded by airborne landings by the US 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions on the western flank of the attack, and by the British 6th Airborne Division on the eastern flank. The aim of these landings, which started very soon after midnight on the 5th, 6th of June, was to secure the flanks of the Allied beachhead so as to prevent the seaborne invasion being rolled up from either the east or the west. The landings on the three British beaches were carried out by the 50th Infantry Division on Gold, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division on Juneau, and the 3rd British Infantry Division on Sword. The first troops were ashore on Gold, Sword, and Juneau soon after 7 in the morning, supported by naval guns and DD, or duplex drive amphibious tanks which had been launched a great deal earlier, some two and a half miles offshore. Incidentally, it was the failure of the Americans to get sufficient DD tanks ashore that was, well, that was to cost them so dear on Omaha Beach. So, on the British beaches, by 9.30, a firm foothold about a mile in depth had been secured. Meanwhile, on the American beaches, the US 4th Infantry Division was landing on Utah Beach, and the US 1st Infantry Division was landing at Omaha. The 4th Division encountered very little opposition from the Germans and was starting to make its way in, inland to join up with the scattered 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions, which of course had dropped during the night. But it was at Omaha that the US 1st Infantry Division ran into a hail of fire at HR, which for them was at 6.30. Casualties in the leading American waves were as high as 70%. By 9 o'clock, the Americans had managed to crawl to the shelter of the sea wall but they were pinned there by the withering German fire, many miles from their planned objective. At this stage, it looked to the defending troops as if they had stopped the invasion dead on the beach. So that was where we were exactly 50 years ago. Now, some thought that the resistance met at Omaha might have been typical of resistance on every beach. Of course, no one had expected the landings would be easy. Hitler, after all, had announced long ago that he had constructed an Atlantic wall, the length of the West European coastline. And while even some Germans rejected this as purely a figment of Hitler's cloud cuckoo land, as they called it, the Allies did not underestimate it. Under Rommel's energetic direction, they knew that it had become what one historian 
later summed up in this way. Never in the history of modern warfare had a more powerful and deadly array of defences been prepared for an invading army. The Atlantic Wall was not going to be taken for granted. Let's join Vivian White. All the way along the Normandy beaches, while the Allied armies prepared for their landings, the Germans, with equal care, prepared their welcome. The Atlantic Wall guarded the whole of the coast of northern France, from Brest and Brittany along to the Pas de Calais. The Germans set out to turn Hitler's Europe, literally, into a fortress strong enough to deter any attack. Slave labor was used by the Nazis to help them, and over two years along the beaches, a forest of fortifications arose. Gun emplacements, pillboxes, and obstacles meant to stop or sink any landing craft attempting an invasion. Over a million tons of iron and millions of cubic meters of concrete were poured into the coast. Hitler's propaganda chiefs persuaded the Germans that the wall was impregnable. And the awful losses suffered by the Canadians in their raid at Dieppe in 1943 persuaded the Allies to take the wall just as seriously. This is the battery at Long with its four gun emplacements. These guns could fire 12 and a half miles out to sea with an arc wide enough to cover the American Omaha Beach to the west and the British Gold to the east. Despite the best efforts of Allied air forces and naval power to silence them, these guns kept on firing until the night of the 6th of June. Nowadays, nothing more fearsome emerges from these batteries than parties of tourists curious to examine these huge military fossils. But on D-Day, each of these strong points became the scene of a crucial encounter. We uh, laid a, a barrage, well, a barrage uh, on the beach, but uh, the British troops who, uh, uh, which had landed uh, soon spread uh, um, a thick cloud of fog. There along the beach was a cloud perhaps uh, two a mile or even more. So I couldn't see what was going on, and uh, I fired uh, uh, at the beach on, on random, hoping to, to hit an aim. This is Point Duoc at the westernmost end of Omaha Beach, another strong point of the Atlantic Wall. It was pounded in the early hours of the morning from the air. Then American Rangers, the equivalent of our commandos, stormed the cliffs to take it. They were besieged here for the whole day. The Atlantic War was fearsome, and many brave men died overcoming it. And it had the extra power, not just of steel and concrete, but of a myth two years in the making. In the end, the impregnable Atlantic Wall was broken. Broken by the power that the Allies threw at it, from the land, from the air, and from the sea. And I'm joined again by General Farndale and Charles Wheeler, First of all, why Normandy, General Farndale? Well, when the decision was made to cross the Channel, the Allies had to have a port. The Germans knew they had to have a port, otherwise they couldn't get the build-up. Uh, the Germans therefore defended the ports. And it's reputed that when General Morgan was planning the crossing, a young naval officer said, why don't we take a port with us? And of course, this opened up many more opportunities. They could now choose a more suitable beach, a more suitable exits to the beach, area for exploitation, within range of fighters in UK, plenty of sea for the Navy, and that all came together on these beaches in Normandy, and Charles, it proved successful. Charles Wheeler? Germans were very thick on the ground in the part of Calais. That was where they were going to invade Britain. They always assumed that we would take the short sea route too, partly because of the port, but obviously it was closer. Uh, this was relatively undefended at the time of the original planning. And Despite very, the Atlantic Wall? Well, the Atlantic Wall was built up, but it was thin, and it was always much thinner down here than it was up there. The disadvantage, of course, was this was terrible country to attack in and very easy country to defend. So that after D-Day, things got very difficult. So the planners didn't, I think, pay enough attention to the difficulties that would ensue uh, if we didn't break through yes. early, which well, of course we didn't. That, that's a later stage in the story. I think we should also say this after all was the second front, the first front, was fought and had been fought by the Russians for a long time. We shouldn't forget the part they played, truly, General Farndale. Absolutely. Hitler made a major decision of a strategic error in attacking Russia before eliminating the United Kingdom. 
Therefore, it was inevitably true that part of the German army would be held up on the Russian front wherever D-Day took place. 200 divisions. And 200 divisions, most effective. What would have happened if those 200 divisions had been available here in France? So we should remember, Charles Wheeler, the role that the Russians played. They're not being unreasonable when they say, in a sense, they were part of D-Day. They were the turning point. D-Day was not the turning point in the war. The turning, there were two turning points in the war. One was the uh, Pearl Harbor, when the Americans came in, when Hitler declared war on the Americans foolishly, and the other was when Hitler invaded Russia. Those were the real turning points. So that is... Later, and I think a lesser turning point. Yes, but the, so that is why it was an allied operation, a combined allied unity at that stage. Let's leave it there. Leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much. Now, the crossing by the fleet, which stretched further than the eye could see, was described by one eyewitness as the most impressive, unforgettable sight. But the seas were very high, and many of the troops aboard were extremely seasick. According to the naval commander, Admiral La Ramsey, the total absence of enemy opposition in the air or at sea gave the whole thing an air of unreality. But as they drew closer to the beaches, all that changed. Went out onto the bridge, and there, as the dawn broke, suddenly there in front of me was the beach that I studied the ocean and photographs. Looking from the deck, all you could see was uh, on the beaches a pall of smoke hanging over the whole place, and little landing craft coming off the beaches back to their mothership, and then turning around going in again. Overhead, the planes are going in, and the, the shelling from our big ships is going over. You wonder what would happen if two shells met head on, but they didn't do. And we just bowed on through the water. Our orders were not to stop to help anybody at all, whatever happened. If it was your best pal, you had to leave him. It was a, an experience never to be forgotten. How the LCA coxswain did a marvellous job in avoiding the stakes, and. Uh, other obstacles that were placed just off the beach to prevent us from landing. And in amongst all that chaos was the gunfire, the shells, the mortar, and they were just fantastic in getting us through. The naval crews who were steer, get, guiding us in and, and steering the landing craft opened the ramp, and our soldiers, thinking it was the beach proper, jumped in, in fact, jumped into six foot of water. Major Martin, brandishing his airborne bicycle over his head, turned round, and he's a big man, six foot two or three anyway, and an army rugger player, and with a great shout said, 24th, follow me. Whereupon he disappeared off the end of the, le of the ramp and went straight down. We didn't see anything, not even the bicycle. Nothing was left sticking out of the water. We thought it was the funniest thing we'd seen in for years, and all the men had really helped morale enormously. The ramp went down and we jumped out, and we were about wasty, which is not too bad. And uh, then we went, uh, as we were trained to do, we went hell for leather across the up the beach. And then, crash, and the guns opened, people started going in, and the thing was completely obliterated. There was a lot of noise and confusion, and uh, uh, by that I mean there was uh, uh, enemy mortar and shell fire coming, coming down, and, and machine guns firing down the beach. And uh, but we made it to the, to the dunes of the far side. We lost two people on that, um, but apart from that, the rest of us made it. Well, my first reaction was to say to myself, "By gum, there isn't much room here. This is a narrow beach." And then a young lieutenant came to me and jumped down beside me. And he said, it's all right for you, Padre. You've got faith. But there are a lot of us here we haven't, and it's hell. There's an element of um, shock, really, about going into action for the first time. There's no doubt about that. You see your first dead. Brits, you know, as opposed to um, the enemy. You see your enemy dead. You you don't want to go to sleep. You, you, you're you all the time alert. We were bumped into by numbers of patrols all through the night. Uh, but when you have a quiet moment, and I had to go around and make sure that everybody's in the right position, and so on and so forth, about um, 
three in the morning or something like that, you get your head down. I think um, probably everybody, although they might not admit to it, probably say a, a, a prayer of thank you to somebody. The face and experience of battle, impossible to imagine if you haven't done it. Now conditions were different on all five assault beaches and so were the fortunes of those landing there. And on the main American beach, Omaha, as we've heard, the German resistance was so severe that the American commander, General Bradley, even contemplated withdrawal briefly. At Omaha, the Americans were the victims of unexpectedly strong currents, heavy cloud cover, a mass of underwater obstacles and a barrage of enemy fire. The first wave of assaulting GIs was mown down, tanks were lost, landing craft capsized in high seas, men drowned under the weight of their own equipment. Reinforcements arrived to find the first assault wave still backed up on the beach, and in one day at Omaha alone, the Americans suffered almost 3,000 casualties. Of course, the extraordinary thing is things could have been worse, because even as the fighting raged, there was one nagging thought running through the minds of many on the Allied side. Of course, they'd gone to extreme lengths to conceal their intentions and to maintain secrecy, but how had the Germans come to be taken quite so by surprise? As the Allies landed in Normandy, it became clear that the deception planners behind Operation Fortitude South had pulled off one of the greatest military contracts of all time. Guided by what Ultra told them about German thinking, and by the coordinated use of dummies, double agents and false wireless traffic, the Germans were duped into piecing together this map of a vast phantom Allied force, commanded by General Patton, preparing to invade the Pas de Calais. Until the third week of June, the Germans continued to believe the main assault would hit Calais. They thought the Normandy landings were a diversion. The fear that the Pas de Calais was coming any minute remained very, very lively and very limiting on their, on their activity. I think it, it might be said, really, that, that the deception plan was more useful after than before. Of course, their major anxiety had now been removed. There was a Normandy landing, as well as what they still expected, a Pas de Calais landing. But the Germans were cautious. On June the 8th, ultra signals showed that two panzer divisions were being moved from Calais toward Normandy. It was then that the double agent, known as Garbo, sent a message to his German control stating boldly that Normandy was a diversion and that the main attack would still be against Calais. More or less was lecturing the German high command and the Hitler in person as to what they ought to do. It was a staggering piece of impudence, really, and how, and how he got away with it was one of the great miracles, I think, of the whole thing. Within a few hours, Bletchley confirmed that the order had been countermanded. In any event, half the tanks turned back. Quite by chance, the Germans had in fact changed their codes on June the 6th. For 48 hours, Ultra went quiet. From the morning of the 8th, we broke the most valuable and the most talkative of German Air Force keys, which was the key they used for liaison between the German army and, them, and the Air Force. This told the Allies a great deal about the state of German plans and reinforcements and what the resistance couldn't know, where they were being put. And then it located the HQ of Panzer Group West, where the German counterattack was being planned. The actual hotel in the town and the um, position on the map came in ultra in the morning of um, the 10th of June. And on the afternoon of the 10th of June, that headquarters was totally destroyed by bomber command. And the destruction of Panzer Gruppe West put an end to it. It forced the Germans, finally, though they were gradually being forced onto it anyway, onto the defensive. And they had, from then onwards, to concentrate on holding the beachhead instead of cracking it in the middle. That was its, its, its significance. It was extraordinarily ingenious. Now, uh, back here at uh, Aramanche, uh, there's the, the, the scene uh, behind me. There's uh, 
a British vessel, a landing ship, uh, quietly moored in the middle of the harbour. The weather, as you see, is not bad at the moment. The sea's comparatively flat. And uh, the town itself, which was absolutely buzzing with people yesterday, it's now been heavily cordoned off for the British event later today at, uh, at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock British time, the Queen will be here. Those are some of the security people, soldiers on the beach. In the town itself, the French police themselves, uh, making sure that almost nobody uh, goes in. A lot of security going on in and around uh, Aramanche. They'll let the people in and the visitors later in due course. But by this time of the day, 50 years ago, the left flank, as we've heard, hinged on the Pegasus Bridge, was secure. The British and Canadians were making progress, as were the Americans on Utah. Omaha, as we've heard, was proving a desperate struggle. But back at home, the people of Great Britain woke up to a day without the slightest idea of its real significance. This is London. London calling in the home, overseas and European services of the BBC and through United Nations Radio Mediterranean. And this is John Snag speaking. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, have just issued communique number one, and in a few seconds I will read it to you. Communique number one. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. And that was how the world heard the news of uh, D-Day. Um, I think we should say some more about the whole question of intelligence and deception. I'm joined again by Nigel Dilley and, and Mike, Mike Dewar. Um, intelligence at various levels. Well, let's start with, with the deception, because there was deception at various different levels. Was, was there not the tactical and the high-level deception? Mike Dewar. Yes, indeed, there was. I mean, I think we need to differentiate between the two, really, John. That is the strategic level, and that was the attempt to persuade the Germans that we might land perhaps in Norway, alternatively the south of France, alternatively around Brest in, in Brittany, or the Pas de Calais. It was a great big overall plan. And then at the lower level, when D-Day actually happened here in Normandy, there was the attempt to persuade the Germans that it might still happen, that this was a feint. It might still happen at the Pas de Calais. So that was more at the tactical level. So I think that's the first important thing to distinguish. Let me just um, <coughs> uh, ask Nigel Dalee. I mean, what is extraordinary is, in military terms, how much real serious effort was put into the deception. This wasn't just a casual uh, bit of, uh, of activity. This was immensely thorough, wasn't it? Oh, yes, indeed. It started in the early days of the war when we were markedly inferior to our enemies and it was a matter of necessity to persuade the Axis powers to grossly overestimate the size of our own forces. And we became very good at it through experience. And in the Mediterranean theatre, 1943 and 1944, the Germans always imagined that we had a third more troops than we did and they were always obsessed with a mythical threat to the Balkans. Which it was in our interest to foster, and presumably we, we did. Oh, we maintained it. Um, I think most people have heard of Operation Mincemeat, the, the man who never was, the planting of dummy plans and papers on the Germans through uh, a body that was washed ashore in Spain. But there are other plans too, based upon false radio transmissions, the use of double agents, the Germans relied excessively upon agents and we managed to turn enough of them to poison the information going into their system. I think things like um, the uh, dead body washed, washed ashore with the false plans, in a way it's very easy for, uh, to, to underestimate how important that was because there's a tendency to think of this as part of the games of war rather than the real substance. And this was, an ab this was a very real part of the preparation, wasn't it, Mike John? Absolutely. And deception was something which the British, funnily enough, were particularly good at. The Americans rather poo-pooed it and it took a long time to be, be, be persuaded that it was a useful instrument of war. I mean, we started our first deception efforts in the desert in 1942 with dummy vehicles, dummy pipelines, dummy railways. Uh, and uh, that went a long way to defeating Rommel's Africa Corps. We then, then came Operation Mincemeat and various other British efforts all around the world. And it was not until here in Normandy the Americans were persuaded of the usefulness, the real usefulness, of the art of deception in warfare. So it, it went with the British character somehow. The Americans who were used to mass and to firepower and to 
all, all the other engines of war rather felt they didn't need it. Yes. Has anybody ever, Nigel Dilley, been able to uh, assess what sort of impact the successful deception had? You know, how many divisions was it, uh, was it worth? Well, it, in uh, the Mediterranean theatre, it probably tied up 60 or 70 German divisions that could have been much better used elsewhere. Here, it, in, here in Normandy, specifically, of course, it kept the second panzer division at Amiens because they were still convinced for many weeks after the landings here in Normandy that the Pas de Calais may be the target after all, and that, set, that vital division, the second panzer, were kept up there and, and sort of been deployed down here by Hitler. And was this something that the Germans did at all, Nigel Dilley? They weren't good at it. Um, they did attempt deceptions of their own, but they were usually detectable. In fact, the whole German intelligence apparatus was very poorly managed, chaotic. There was one lovely story in Holland where the Germans had built a dummy, a dummy airfield and we'd been watching them building this dummy airfield for many months and a lone mosquito came in one morning and dropped a wooden bomb on it uh, which sent a particular message to the Germans. Mm. Um, I think one of the uh, other things that uh, is important to remember is how uh, the preparations that took place before Operation Neptune sailed and of course before the task force actually landed. And, um, one of the extraordinary things was how people actually knew where they were on the beaches when they, they, they came to land. Submarines were underwater, underhand, and damned un-English. No occupation for a gentleman. Such was the view of submariners in the early part of this century. It was thought sneaky, creeping around beneath the water, out of view of conventional craft. The Jolly Roger, flown by submariners, gives us some idea, though, of the pride they had in their role and that reputation. On the evening of Friday, the 2nd of June, 1944, two ex-craft like this one set out to uphold the very best of submarining traditions. Their job was to creep undetected to the Normandy coast, and they were then to sit on the bottom until dawn on D-Day. Their job then was to run up lights on masts to guide the Allied fleet in. George Honor was a lieutenant commanding one of the subs at the time. George, what were conditions like being underwater for so long? Well, by the time D-Day came, we'd been submerged for nearly four days, and it was getting very murky, and the oxygen supply could have been running out, as we had no knowledge of how long our supply would last. Um, we were a little bit worried, too, because when we set off on the operation, we were called Operation Gambit, and we looked this up in the local library, and we found it was a the move you throw away before a big move in chess, which didn't exactly excite us. So, Jim, what was your role in the operation? Well, I was in an organisation called COP, Combined Operations Pilage and Reconnaissance Party, and my team's job embarked in the X-23 was to arrive off the Sword Beach, in fact, 48 hours before, uh, fix our position extremely accurately, which we had to do, and then uh, produce a marker lamp which could be shone to seaward at the actual time of the invasion. So the leading craft would then see the line to come in on, and they wouldn't go farther to the east, which would have been extremely dangerous for them. So when did you hear that D-Day itself was actually going to go ahead? We heard um, by wireless transmission on Monday night, during the hours of darkness. We only surfaced for a very short time, stuck our aerial up, got the message, and went down again and waited a further 24 hours. And what were conditions like then? The weather was still terribly bad. Waves were breaking over the craft. We had to pump out all the time. And we were very surprised that the invasion was then on, but very relieved, as our oxygen may well have been running out. Is what were conditions like inside for five men? Well, we were all right as long as the oxygen supply kept up. Of course, it was murky, damp and otherwise very horrible, and there was a feeling of uh, rather like a couple of stiff gins. It's only when you climb in one of these craft for yourself, you see how cramped conditions must have been for five men in here altogether. This is the control room. If they wanted to grab a couple of hours sleep, then they could go there. That's the battery room back there. A testimony to the danger of being an ex-craft submariner in wartime is the memorial here at the Submarine Museum in Gosport. I don't remember ever feeling it, it, it was dangerous, but then that is what happens in, the, in, in war. I think servicemen never believe that anything could happen to them. 
There's some action out here behind us. If you uh, look out onto the horizon, you can see an impressive array of uh, vessels below, past, of course, way past the, the Marlbury Harbour. Um, slightly missed, but they look quite impressive. What 5,000, 6,000 vessels must have looked like was absolutely extraordinary. Uh, a couple of landing craft coming in there. Mike, do you, do you know, can you guess where they come from? Yes, we can actually see, I don't know whether the viewers can, but we can actually see Fearless right on the horizon, yes. one, of, one of our assault ships, one of two, the other is Intrepid. Fearless is taking part in these. That's Fearless on the right on the horizon. Um, now, coming in now, landing craft from Fearless, and these were used in the Falklands campaign to land vehicles and indeed bring men ashore. And uh, splendidly led by a, by a piper pretty well uh, atop the, the mast. Absolutely. These have a considerable capacity. Uh, they haven't actually ever been used, these particular craft, in an opposed landing. The Falklands landing, of course, strictly was unopposed. The landing craft that came in on the day were, of course, meeting a hail of fire. Uh, and the superstructures on these modern landing craft are a little higher and indeed have such luxuries as glass in them, mm. which would have been dangerous on D-Day. We can't, of course, sadly, bring you what the piper is playing. There are also two uh, buglers standing by by the side, so it looks as if this bit of the operating says there there come the uh, the bow doors are down, and um, we'll we may not stay to see what what rolls off, but uh, an, another part of the build up to the day's events at uh, at at Aramors. The second second bow door is down, and there they are, uh, very close into the harbour with bits of the Mulberry Harbour. The, Walk the tide breaking over the one on the left and uh, the cliffs of uh, beyond Aramanche behind. On board the landing craft, that service there is a service by the Royal Marines. And uh, what they're going to do after this is when the little service is, is over, they'll scatter their wreaths on the water of Aramanche Harbour. It is, John, of course, a very appropriate <coughs> place for this service to take place. So many men and so many materials came ashore on this very site, didn't they? Yes. Uh, and so many men must have died not only in action here, but also just in ma maintaining this extraordinary artificial mm. port for so long. We'll, we'll come back to that uh, little ceremony uh, as, it, as it develops. In the meantime, we were talking about um, the deception side of the Allied activity, but uh, the intelligence the managing of intelligence is very, very, very different. Um, again, how much importance do we attach to the correct and systematic gathering of intelligence, Nigel? Oh, it's absolutely critical to the success of any military operation, particularly if you're up against the odds. And the British view was always that the human factors, like intelligence, are more important to military success than the material factors, like the amount of equipment you have. So we always played exceptional um, gave exceptional care to the gathering and use of intelligence and of course the other side of the coin was deception and generally the Germans relied far too heavily on paid agents during the Second World War. They'd read too much John Buck and too much uh, Compton Mackenzie. They, they, they were romantic in their approach to intelligence whereas the British were cynical, devious and highly realistic. Mike, is that, that, that fair of our approach to intelligence? I think, I think that's very fair. One good example of that was a German general who was being repatriated. He was seriously ill, and arrangements were made for him to be returned to Germany via the Red Cross. And what happened was the British drove him through Hampshire and the enormous build-up of material there and forces and so on, and told him he was in Kent. And, of course, there were no signposts in those days. And he believed he was in Kent, and, of yes. course, this reinforced the charade of General Patton, who was talking to old ladies' tea parties all around Kent, mm. and pretending he led something called FUSAG, the first United States Army group, which of course was going to go across at the Pas de Calais. Yeah. So that's the obverse of the coin, counterintelligence, if yeah. you like. Now, um, is it also the mm -hmm. case, uh, were we significantly better, Nigel Tilly, at uh, intelligence? I mean, apart from the fact that you say that the Germans spent too much time um, concentrating on, on agents, were we in general better? at intelligence more systematic than the Germans? Certainly we were because we had a better organization for handling it. Our intelligence system was united, came together in the Joint Intelligence Committee in London, which also included foreign office representation. 
In Germany, there are many competing agencies, all trying to get the ear of the Führer and win his approval by telling him things he wanted to hear. So we pooled intelligence, and the, the, the critical factor in intelligence work is not so much the gathering of information, but its assessment to derive its significance. Yeah. So you draw it from a variety of sources, signals intelligence at the high level, um, which was done at Bletchley, and at the lower level, uh, the Y service intercepting German signals, analyzing the traffic, even if you couldn't read what they were saying. Prisoner war interrogation, of course, that wasn't available here because if you're out of contact, as we were before D-Day, you, you don't catch prisoners and you can't interrogate them. And of but course, other factors like air reconnaissance, which we might talk, air about, uh, talk about later. Yep. Critical, yes. Let's, let's leave it there for, for the moment. Uh, these are all factors which contributed to the success of D-Day. Uh, it was, after all, a day of high risk, high endeavor, and ultimately high achievement. And it delivered everything that was demanded of it. Tom Fleming now takes up the story. Hard to believe sometimes that across these peaceful, lush fields of Normandy, the ocean of green, they call it, 50 years ago, the chaos of the battle for the liberation of Western Europe was engaged. A battle fought by young men in their teens and twenties who had drifted from the night sky or struggled from the gray morning sea. To children, it's history. And to childhood in Normandy, a poet once wrote, is the sweet scent of an apple orchard. The greatest combined military operation in the story of mankind had a cost. It is a cost written in rows of silent gravestones. On one day, D-Day itself, two and a half thousand on the Allied side were lost. 10,000 if you count the wounded and the missing. By the end of the battle for Normandy in the August, that number had grown to over 200,000. The first British airborne soldier fell in the action to capture the bridge over the Conn Canal at Benneville before D-Day had dawned. The cafe at Pegasus Bridge, as it's now called, was the first house to be liberated in France. The Gondres, who own it still, the first family to be set free from the yoke of Nazi occupation. Pegasus, the winged horse of Greek mythology, symbol of the 6th Airborne Division, remembered with gratitude in this window in the village church at Bromville. The church and its medieval tower were at the heart of the fierce struggle to capture the village early in the morning of 6th June, 50 years ago. Along the wall in the little churchyard, among the good people of Bromville who've lived out there three score years and ten, are the graves of 47 British soldiers of the air landing force, almost all in their twenties, their short lives ended on the day of their landing or the day that followed. The flag of Normandy flies above the church today. And the square below is named after the commanding officer of the 6th Airborne who landed by glider at 3.30 a.m. on D-Day and walked to Ronville, which had been taken by his own men an hour before. A few weeks later, in August, a burial ground adjacent to the church was laid out, and this has now become Ronville War Cemetery. Two and a half thousand are buried in all the serenity of a British garden. Airborne troops and men of the ground forces who fought around Caen, sailors, marines and airmen too. Side by side lie a brigadier who was 49, a para of 18 years, a padre, a Jewish lad, and a boy from a highland glen. Last night, in the late evening, the Royal Yacht Britannia sailed along the Conn Canal through the splendid new Pegasus Bridge, which earlier this year replaced 
the celebrated old one. On board were Her Majesty the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, Princess Margaret, Princess Royal, and her husband, Commander Lawrence, the Duke of York, all of whom, with the Prince of Wales, will be attending this morning simultaneous services of remembrance in five separate cemeteries. Princess Margaret will be coming here to Romville to attend a service which begins just after 11 o'clock local time. Among the veterans already gathered a profusion of red berries as you might expect and the service will be conducted by the principal of the RAF Chaplain School, Amport House, near Andover. At almost exactly this very hour, your time at home, 50 years ago, men from the 1st Battalion, the South Lanx, who had landed on Sword Beach two hours previously, entered the village of Hermonville, less than two miles from the sea. From the village church tower, the first bells from liberated France were broadcast to the world by the BBC. And the chateau became briefly the third division headquarters. And in these fields around, dressing stations were set up for the wounded. British and Canadian casualties were brought here. Also French civilians and resistance fighters caught in the battle. And for some thousand Commonwealth soldiers, the fields of Hermanville became their last resting place. The shelter of the British cemetery is built like the outbuilding of a Normandy farmhouse. Each year, Marines and men of the 3rd Division come back here. This year, on this June morning, more than ever, for a service which will begin shortly in the presence of His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. A service that will be conducted by the Deputy Chaplain General. And before each single grave, and there are the graves of 986 British soldiers, sailors and airmen, 13 Canadians and three Australian airmen here at Hermanville, have been laid roses and carnations, put there in a moving ceremony last evening by school children from Hermanville and children from Tangmere in Sussex, which is twinned with this little French village. Almost 27 miles due west of Hermobile, on a memorial to the 1,837 Commonwealth soldiers of 50 years ago who died in Normandy and have no known grave, I found these words in Latin. We, once conquered by William, have now set free his native land. Are you? its famous 11th century cathedral, almost lost in the mist this morning, originally built by William's half-brother, Bishop Odo, was freed at midday on D plus one. The memorial designed by Philip Hepworth. It was William the Conqueror's queen, Matteo, who was long thought to have embroidered the famous Bayeux tapestry, illustrating the most famous seaborne invasion until our own time. Hitler used it as propaganda to prove the invasion of Great Britain was possible. It was taken to the south of France in 1940 and remained there until 1945. The outskirts of Bayeux were in Allied hands by the evening of D-Day. And the first British troops, men of the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry, entered the city on the 7th of June. There was little resistance, and unlike other towns in Normandy, Caen, saint lô for instance, Bayeux suffered little damage. Its narrow medieval streets were not constructed to take the heavy military vehicles of a modern army on the move, and so the Allies built a ring road, still called the Boulevard of the 6th of June. And today, the road usually thronged with trucks and buses is empty of traffic. The southwestern section is called the Rue de General Sir Fabian Ware, after the volunteer who came to France in 1915 with the Red Cross and who masterminded the work of the Graves Registration Service and later the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. 
some 6,000 veterans and important guests from Commonwealth and allied countries have come to crowd round the Cross of Sacrifice this morning in the largest British Second World War Cemetery in France here at Bayeux. They've come to remember. After all the jolly reunions, now the quiet music, the reflection, and later the silence. After the warm sunshine of yesterday, a grey, steady, chilling drizzle. There are over four and a half thousand graves, almost four thousand of the British soldiers, marines, sailors, merchant seamen, airmen too, brought together from the countryside around where the fighting was hard from the coast five miles away and from dressing stations and field hospitals nearby. The chestnut trees planted as saplings in 1955 speak of the passing of the years and under the shade of their branches is the band of the Royal Artillery whose music you have heard. And amongst the over four and a half thousand graves are graves from many Commonwealth countries and from allied countries too and how eloquently the silent rows of headstones speak of the remarkable courage and the understandable fear of these days and weeks in Normandy so long ago. Everyone a proud mother's son. There are 181 Canadians, 17 Australians, 8 New Zealanders, 1 South African, 25 Poles, 3 Frenchmen, 2 Czechs, 2 Italians and 7 Russians lying side by side at Bayeux. Unknown soldier but unforgotten. And there are German graves too, 466 of them, 75,000 Germans are buried in the soil of Normandy, some old men by the reckoning of war, not a few mere boys of 17 and a half, children of 12 when the war began. Hans Joachim died two days before his 18th birthday. And what an amazing sight here in Bayeux Cemetery. The standards of the veterans, the veterans themselves, some in wheelchairs, some wearing their berries, the flags of regimental associations. And none seem distressed by the coldness of the drizzling rain. And in the roadway in front of the memorial to the missing of Normandy, there are two guards of honor awaiting the arrival of Her Majesty the Queen and President Mitterrand. President Mitterrand has been delayed, and uh, so naturally the Queen is waiting to uh, arrive with the President of France. The band is the French Air Force Staff Band, which will greet the two heads of state of the national anthems of Great Britain and France. From France, officers and men from the Air Force Base at Chateau d'Ain, between Chartres and Tours. They're under the command of Colonel Gallus, and they have their color with them. Vertical tricolor, blue, white, and red, adopted as France's national flag 200 years ago. From the United Kingdom, There is a guard of honor found by the Normandy Company from the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. 
under the command of Major Robert Bruce of the King's Own Royal Border Regiment. And their colour is borne by Officer Cadet Julius Caesar um, to conjure with in feats of conquest. The overall British troop commander is Colonel Bob Pridham, the Royal Engineers. And the Normandy Company from Sandhurst this afternoon represent Britain at the International Parade at Omaha. The Queen and President Mitterrand, President Mitterrand we hear will be arriving in some eight minutes from now will then walk down this road, the roadway named after Sir Fabian Ware, who died in his 80s in 1949. All British war cemeteries and the Commonwealth War Graves Commission um, look after nearly a million graves in over 150 countries and in each cemetery there is a cross of sacrifice medals proudly worn standards proudly held old friends recognized and remembered but they're here today to honor those who lie in the graves behind them. Veterans of almost all the 29 regiments entitled to emblazon the Normandy landing battle honor on their colors are here. The Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry have 20 representatives, including the Reverend Leslie Skinner, a chaplain with the 8th Armoured Brigade who landed with them on the beaches here. And what tales these tell of courage. There was one supreme reward for courage, one on D-Day. The BC was awarded to Company Sergeant Major Stan Hollies of the Green Hards. But here in Bayeux is the grave of Corporal Sidney Bates of the Royal Norfolk Regiment, who died at the end of the battle for Normandy, aged 23 after an action of supreme courage. He was wounded three times, and to save his section, attacked the enemy with a machine gun, was hit a third time mortally and fell and continued firing until his strength failed. The Camberwell boy, the loving son. There are Canadians here too, in blue blazers with the maple leaf badge, grey trousers. Canadian veterans came over to London for the unveiling of their own memorial in Green Park last Friday by Her Majesty the Queen. And some wearing their husbands medals on the right hand side of their dresses. War widows are here. I've talked to one or two walking around the graves yesterday. One had only been married for two and a half years, one for five years, and one said, there's my husband, and burst into tears. As we await the arrival of Her Majesty the Queen here at Bayeux, Princess Margaret has arrived at Ronville War Cemetery. She is an honorary Air Commodore of RAF Coningsbury. And there again, the Red berries of the Paras. This cemetery at Dronville is really known as the 
Paras Samadran. Princess Margaret was only 14 on D-Day, but I'm sure she remembers the occasion well. Her father, King George VI, came over to the Normandy beaches just uh, some eight days after the landings. We have come together in the presence of Almighty God on this historic occasion give thanks for the success of the Normandy landings 50 years ago. Today we remember all those who gave their lives and the pattern of that service will be repeated in all the five cemeteries. Thanksgiving for the deeds of courage, remembrance of those who fell, remembrance too of those who mourn. There's the Prime Minister of uh, Australia, Paul Keating, the Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand's here too, Mr. Bolger. The Chiefs of uh, Staff are here, parliamentary leaders. We saw Mrs. Margaret Beckett arrive, uh, the Deputy leader of the Labour Party, Paddy Ashdown's here, leader of the Liberal Democrats, and uh, former defence ministers, Tom King we saw uh, arriving. And at Bayeux here there will be those with uh, family connections too members of the Churchill family, Viscount Montgomery. Churchill, of course, visited Monty's headquarters in Normandy just six days after D-Day. And this is the scene at Hermonville. A little cemetery, if you can call it a little cemetery, which contains a thousand graves. And as you would imagine, in a Normandy field. The cemetery is built in an orchard. The Prince of Wales salutes the cross of sacrifice. And so, all over Normandy, there are these services of remembrance. And there are, indeed, the 16 war cemeteries in Normandy, run by two groups of gardeners. And you can imagine the problem that they've had in the tempestuous, stormy weather that we've had over the last week. And uh, then yesterday, the day of sun, when all the cemeteries were cleared up and made to look immaculate as they always are. And uh, today again, the rain and the drizzle the Macintoshes, worn but not covering the medals. This is essentially a British occasion here at Bayo, although of course there are representatives from the Commonwealth and indeed from allied countries too. We now believe that President Mitterrand has arrived along at the end of the road, his helicopter is here, and when 
Her Majesty the Queen and he meet up. Then they will walk along to the cemetery here where all these veterans are awaiting her presence eagerly. She came here 10 years ago for the commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the landings. The Royal Artillery Band under the direction of Major Terry Davis plays beneath the chestnut trees. And on the cross of sacrifice, uh, the Queen and President Mitterrand will both lay a wreath in memory of the fallen of both countries because of course we're remembering too all the brave French resistance fighters who laid down their lives in the same cause. The King of Norway is to be here too and the Grand Duke of Luxembourg Grand Duke John actually landed on the beaches in Normandy just uh, three days after D-Day. He was serving with the Irish Guards then. And so, while we await the beginning of the service here in Bayeux, so we join the service in Ronville. All the days of our life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And in the cemetery at Ronville, Princess Margaret lays a wreath. <coughs> cemetery immediately to the south of the church. After this, it was noised abroad that Mr. Valiant for Truth was sent for by a summons. And when he understood it, he called for his friends and told them of it. Then he said, I am going to my father's, and though with great difficulty I have got hither, yet now do I know not, do I not repent me of all the troubles I have been to arrive at where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him <coughs> that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I fought his battles who will now be my rewarder. When the day came that he must go hence was come, Many accompanied him to the riverside, into which, as he went, he said, Death, where is thy sting? And as he went down deeper, he said, Grave, where is thy victory? And so he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side.
words, the Bunyan words that will echo all around these five cemeteries in Normandy. Here in another, the little cemetery at Hermonville, Prince of Wales, lays his wreath and turns about. After this, it was noise abroad that Mr. Valiant for Truth was sent for by a summons. When he understood it, he called for his friends and told him of it. Then he said, I am going to my father's, and though with great difficulty I have got hither, yet now do I not repent of all the troubles I have been at to arrive. A Wessex of the Queen's flight, bringing Her Majesty the Queen to Bayeux. And His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent it is greeted at the gates of the cemetery at Bayeux. Uh, the Prime Minister of France, Edouard Balladur, appointed on the 29th of March, 1993. The Duke of Kent, in his role as host here, he uh, is the president of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, has been since February 1970. And so along the Rue de General Sir Fabian Ware that further along is the boulevard of the 6th of June. Prime Minister arrives, Mrs. Major. He's been uh, on the Royal Yacht Britannia at Caen greeted by the, the Duke of Kent. One of five field marshals present here today. Foreign Secretary, Douglas Heard. Prime Minister was a child of 14 months when uh, D-Day Happened. And so they move up the cemetery. And there the the clergy who will be conducting the service here in Bayeux, Chaplain General, Reverend James Harkness. And uh, Monsignor Noel Mullen, the uh, Director of Navy Chaplaincy Services, and the Reverend Ian Thompson of the Royal Air Force. And 
walking along the road despite the rain and the drizzle and the chillness of the day. The Queen and the President walking together. It's about a five minute walk down the road to the cemetery. Her Majesty, President Mitterrand on the left, the road lined by men of the three services. Ratings from the submarine service and from ships of the home fleet. Men of the 36 Regiment Royal Engineers and RAF men from the United Kingdom and from Germany. President Mitterrand bareheaded, looking rather pale. Duke of Edinburgh is also here. Wearing Admiral of the Fleet uniform. Duchess of Grafton there, and Lieutenant Colonel Blair Stewart, Wilson, the Queen's Equerry. And already the Queen can hear the sounds of the French Air Force Band. Greeted by General Ponce, who is the uh, director of the Rennes, director of the um, Rennes district, military in France. And when the Queen and the President take their place before the guard of honor. They will be greeted by royal salute, the national anthem of France, and the colors will be lowered.
Her Majesty the Queen is being invited to inspect the two guards of honor. She's joined by President Mitron. To inspect these men from the Air Force Base at Chateau d'Ain and the Normandy Company from the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst. President Mitterrand changes to the inside lane, so to speak, to uh, inspect the British Guard of Honor. says thank you very much the guard commander and Colonel Pridham takes his leave as Her Majesty walks across the rain swept road with the present to the entrance to the cemetery. Round trees by the entrance, beech hedges. Queen uh, introduces her cousin, the Duke of Kent, who is uh, present at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, escorts them both in. And now we're on British soil. And uh, Malcolm Rifkin is the chairman of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, as Secretary of State for Defence, Air Chief Marshal Sir Joseph Gilbert has been vice chairman of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission since 1993 and David Kennedy is director general of the Commonwealth War Graves Com Commission uh, since January last year. Joined the commission in 1969, 25 years ago. And so at last the veterans can see the Queen and the President. As they move up across the green grass so lovingly preserved in face of all the thousands of feet that have trampled over it in recent days. Bayeux has been full of veterans. The Queen is met by the Chaplain General, Rem James Harkness, Monsignor Noel Mullin, Director of Navy Chaplaincy Services, Roman Catholic Chaplain, Royal Navy and the Reverend Ian Thomas, uh, the senior chaplain at RAF College in Cranwell, Lincolnshire. The last two will uh, lead the prayers in the service. And it's a service uh, in which we shall be doing three things. We shall be acknowledging all those who by sea, land and air took part in the great endeavor which has entered our history as D-Day. We shall be remembering those who died in Normandy on D-Day and in the days that followed as they struggled to achieve the liberation of France and occupied Europe. And we shall remember, too, the men and women of the French resistance who gave their lives for the same cause. And as we commemorate all these brave men and women, we shall also hold in our hearts and keep in our prayers those who still mourn their loved ones those whose names are, in the words of Ecclesiasticus, whose names liveth evermore upon these white headstones. And we shall be committing ourselves, too, 
to the causes of justice and peace for which those who came here 50 years ago fought and for which so many died. And lastly, giving thanks for liberation from past tyranny. We shall also pray for liberation of our minds and our spirits, that the world at last may have peace. Service will be conducted by the Chaplain General. The first Church of Scotland Chaplain to hold that uh, senior chaplaincy appointment. Chaplain General to the Forces. And the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, President Mitterrand, take their place on the dais. The clergy bow and move to their dais from which they will conduct the service. A service which begins by an introduction by the Chaplain General. come together in the presence of Almighty God on this historic occasion to give thanks for the success of the Normandy landings 50 years ago. Today we remember all those who gave their lives here and in the operations which followed for the liberation of Europe. Those whom we knew and whose memory we cherish. As we acknowledge the heritage of freedom which they won for us, we give thanks for their courage, their devotion to duty, and their comradeship, and pray that we may walk worthy of their sacrifice. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Let us remember before God and commend to his safekeeping those who laid down their lives in the cause of freedom, justice, and peace. They shall not grow old as 
as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. Trumpeters from the Royal Air Force College, Cranwell. We commend to thy mercy the souls of all whom we remember before thee today. Grant that they may ever be an example and inspiration to us, and that we may serve thee faithfully all the days of our life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Reverend Kenneth Ward served in minesweepers, sweeping the pathway in for the ships to the beaches in Normandy. And now Her Majesty the Queen and President Mitron move to lay their wreaths at the foot of the cross of sacrifice. And together, they lay their wreaths.
Queen's wreath of Flanders poppies. They bow and return. And the Duke of Edinburgh, who was serving in the Pacific in 1944, has moved the lectern to read from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress the words that we've already heard. After this, it was noised abroad that Mr. Valiant for Truth was sent for by a summons. When he understood it, he called for his friends and told them of it. Then he said, I am going to my father's, and though with great difficulty I've got hither, yet now do I not repent me of all the troubles I have been to to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I fought his battles who will now be my rewarder. When the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside, into which as he went he said, Death, where is thy sting? And as he went down deeper, he said, Grave, where is thy victory? So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. What a movingly apt reading. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Let us pray a prayer for peace. Almighty God, from whom all thoughts of truth and peace proceed, kindle in our hearts the true love of peace and guide with thy pure and peaceable wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility thy kingdom may go forward till the earth is filled with the knowledge of thy love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for those who mourn. Almighty God, 
Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. A prayer for our world. Almighty God, King of kings and Lord of lords, hear us as we pray to thee for the countries to which we belong. Guide with thy eternal wisdom the leaders of the nations. Make us strong in faith and righteousness and in the love of freedom and grant that we may still be counted worthy to do our part in walking with the nations of the world in the paths of peace. For the honour of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A prayer for ourselves. Merciful Father, to thee we commend ourselves and all who need thy loving correction. Where there is hatred, give love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is sadness, joy. Where there is darkness, light. Grant that we may not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving we receive, in pardoning we are pardoned, and in dying we are born to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things hath done in whom his world rejoices.
let us pledge ourselves to the service of God and our fellow men. We say together, Lord God our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve thee and all mankind in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of thy name. Guide us by thy spirit, give us wisdom, give us courage, give us hope, and keep us faithful now and always. Amen. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, to the queen and the commonwealth, the president and people of France, and the leaders and peoples of all nations, peace and concord, and to us and all his servants, life everlasting, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Blessing by the Chaplain General to the Forces, Reverend James Harkness, and with Monsignor Mullen and Reverend Ian Thompson, he now takes his leave of Her Majesty the Queen. And the Queen and the President now descend from the dais. And before she leaves, the cemetery. She has two, of course, important things to do. To uh, sign the visitor's book. And, of course, to meet the veterans who are now crowding all around. Queen and the President moving down towards the Stone of Remembrance. The young soldiers desperately trying to keep the pathway clear for Her Majesty. transformation in this, this is cemetery in Bayeux. And now Ian Nelson, the uh, senior head gardener here at Bayeux, his father served in the Royal Marines, the Far East, Jonathan Reeve, uh, Monsieur Patrice Couture, French gardener, and Monsieur Richard Moss the tall chap on the right there. But she's speaking to Ian Nelson, and no doubt saying, what a mess we're making of your beautifully kept cemetery with all these thousands of people trampling over. Monsieur Moss on the side celebrated his 50th birthday last Friday and uh, joined the commission 36 years ago when he was 14. He is based at Albert on the Somme, looking after these thousands of graves mostly First World War graves, that multitude of silent witnesses to the desolation of war. And now the Queen and the President will sign the visitor's book, something which uh, so many people who visit the cemeteries do. In fact, there are all sorts of inscriptions here at Bayeux that I've seen 
they gave so much and will be remembered the world mourns for you but we never learn we love you for all you did for us a french girl wrote si jeune so young pourquoi faire la guerre why make war sad and proud to have landed a veteran from australia wrote came back as i said i would wrote another veteran Waited 50 years to find my father, wrote a loving son in May 1944. May 1994, 50 years after his father had come to these beaches. Une vous oublie pas, we will not forget you. Was it worth it, wrote one visitor. And another replied underneath, Yes, but thank you, doesn't seem enough. Duke of Kent now adds his name to the visitor's book. And the Duke of Kent takes President Mitterrand to his car as he now leaves the cemetery and hastens on to the lunch appointment while the Queen will hope to speak to some veterans. Le Président, par oui. We'll have to get in there, brother. Far end, the music of the artillery band. Thanksgiving mingled with sorrow. The French have called these days of commemoration the Jubilee of Freedom. And the people of Normandy, of all French men and women, have cause to remember the devastation of their towns and villages, the loss of innocent lives that are the sad counterpoint to their unbridled joy of being set free again. On buses and in cafe windows, you can see the words, thank you, in English. And the sound of French voices singing their freedom so movingly 50 long years ago still echoes across this countryside that is La Normandie. Allons, enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire. Many years on the clifftops of Normandy, 
High above the sea, among the wreckage of war, there stood a notice, was a sort of simple epitaph. Here opposing soldiers breathed the same air. The battle in its chaos has united them for eternity. And today, we look at a quiet, prosperous countryside. And in this countryside, hundreds of thousands of soldiers 50 years ago fought and many fell. And they fought in these fields, among these hedgerows and forests. And they struggled in and through swamp and scrambled through the flooded fields to their victory. Earlier this morning, after the Prince of Wales had uh, attended the service at uh, uh, Ronville, uh, he went and of course talked to the widows this had Hermonville. He was uh, he talked to the widows of the veterans and uh, spent time hearing their memories and uh, the way in which their sufferings have been uh, remembered and uh, paid tribute to in the services that have taken place uh, along the length and breadth of the coast. And once the services were over, this is at uh, Ronville, it was the time for individuals to pay their own private tribute to their comrades and to take over from the public ceremony and uh, show just how much they remember in a very particular and very individual way of those with whom they fought and uh, those who died alongside them. And, of course, the veterans of the campaign recall it with some tranquility, but even more emotion. Sad. Very sad. Good friends, good comrades. And, uh, all right, we're lucky ones. Uh, I find, above all, it reminds me of the enormous commitment of people of my own age in their 20s in 1944, uh, who gave so much in order to liberate France and uh, free the world of tyranny and the Nazis. Very emotional, really, remembering all those people there so long ago. You don't want it to be a celebration, you just want it to be a commemoration. for the next 24 hours. Certainly a close and damp night coming up.